Good afternoon. Uh, welcome to an event held by the Princeton School for Public and International uh, Affairs. My name is Miguel Centeno. I am faculty here at the school and at Princeton. And it's my pleasure today, really a pleasure, to uh, introduce you to Lolita Buchner Innes and her absolutely beautiful book uh, that's just come out. Uh, it, the title of the book is The Trial of James Collins Johnson. And it's called The Princeton Fugitive Slave. It's an absolutely beautiful book. Lolita, welcome. Thank How are you, you so much. I am terrific. Thank you, Miguel. Thank you. I'm so honored to be here. Just well, tremendously honored. We're honored to have you. Let me just give a little bit of an introduction to you and then uh, explain everybody what the rules are. And we are doing this in conjunction with Labyrinth. So please remember, if you want to buy this book, go to your local bookstore and buy it there. Uh, Lolita is the, uh, she is the Senior Associate Dean for Academic Affairs and Professor of Law at the SMU Southern Methodist University Dedman School of Law. Perhaps more importantly, from the Princetonian point of view, she's a member of the class of 1983, along with our illustrious president, uh, Chris Eisgruber. Uh, this is a gorgeous book. If, if you're going to read a book about uh, the 19th century in the United States, read this book. It, it provides as micro detail about what life was like for the enslaved and for the supposedly free. It talks about the raw violence of slavery. It talks about the ambiguity, very much ambiguity of freedom. Uh, the subaltern position, I think for me, the most moving part are the what we might call the condescension of kindness uh, uh, from some of the students uh, 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 around him, around James Collins Johnson. Uh, I, those, in a sense, those are the most uh, powerful passages in, in the book. Um, what we're going to have is Lydia is going to speak for a little bit, then I will ask a couple of questions, and then we'll take questions from the audience. And with that, Professor, uh, uh, please go ahead. Thank you so much, Miguel. Um, I want to start by uh, just briefly running through a, a couple of slides. And the main reason is because uh, there are throughout the book several images that, that I think are powerful and, and do just as much work uh, as a lot of the narratives. So uh, I'm going to share my screen for a few minutes and, and, and talk a little bit about that slide material. Then I want to uh, read a couple of excerpts from the book, uh, some that, that I think are particularly noteworthy and help to, to frame it. So I will start by sharing my screen. Let's see. And hopefully we'll do this in a way that gets us going. There we go. Success. Success. And I'm going to hit the slideshow button. So uh, what I start out with um, is just the cover of my book, uh, The Princeton Fugitive Slave, The Trials of James Collins Johnson. And I just want to use this not just to introduce the book, but talk a little bit about uh, the, the process of selecting this cover art. Uh, for those of you uh, who've done books, uh, especially those that are biographical, very often you would include a, a photograph uh, of the subject of your work. Uh, for me, this was especially important. One of the things that's particularly noteworthy about James Collins Johnson, about somebody who was born in 1816, is that there are actually several images of him. That is largely due to the fact uh, that uh, when he worked on the Princeton campus, uh, he was often the subject of photos taken by professional photographers. Um, one of the things that maybe we'll get to talk about a little bit later, um, one of the things that was very helpful to me in my research is that Princeton University, like many of the great universities in this country, in this world, they have a tremendous set of archives. But not only that, they have probably one of the richest collections of student and student related materials. When students came to Princeton University or what was formerly the College of New Jersey, students were often given a number of instructions, but one of them was you need to write home to your family once a week. Another one was you need to build mementos, scrapbooks, journals that highlight and talk about your experience here at the college because there was 
always an understanding that coming to Princeton was going to be central in the lives of many of its students. And so very often at the very top of their careers, students were given an empty book and they were told that professional photographers, this was of course by during the age of photography towards the late uh, uh, 19th century, the middle and the late period. In the age of photography, professional photographers would roam the, the campus. They would take picture of the workers, the students, the faculty, the buildings. Um, and of course, the students at the time of graduation would themselves have their photographs taken. And so what would then happen is that while in today's world, it's been true a long time, if you attend a college or even a high school or middle school, you buy a yearbook and those things are already compiled for you. Um, but during the middle and late 19th century, you got a blank book and you were told, purchase images and place notations in your very own scrapbook. And so what you see uh, very often in the Princeton archives are a number of materials that were uh, professionally rendered photographs that were explicitly for student use. This is one of those photos. Now, most of the photographs of James Collins Johnson were those taken from what I would call a servile position because he was a campus servant. So he'd be sitting, he'd be selling something, he would be engaging in a friendly way with students. These were common images. But when I uh, was about finished with this book and I had to choose cover art, I wanted to choose a, a piece of art, a photograph that showed Johnson in all of his glorious independence. And so what you see here is Johnson dressed up in his finest. He is looking straight at the camera. He is not smiling. He looks incredibly serious. There is no basket. There is no wheelbarrow. He is not selling. He is standing up um, and he is acting as a man. Um, that's the image that I thought it was important to portray. Uh, something else that I will point out about this cover, um, and you probably can't read all of it on this image, but you'll notice that there's uh, a notation there. And it says, I never got no free papers. Princeton College bought me, Princeton College owns me, and Princeton College has got to give me my living. Um, that is probably the most compelling uh, thing that Johnson said in terms of being recorded, I'm sure he said many other things, but that's one of the most compelling things that he said where there was some hint of bitterness. And just to give some context um, about this particular quote, Johnson was being interviewed towards the end of its life by uh, a graduate of the university. And that uh, graduate of the university is chatting Johnson up. Um, and he says to Johnson, you know, there are actually lots of people who share the kind of job you used to have as a vendor on campus. One of those people who shares that job is a white man who was a union soldier, you know, and at that point, Johnson seems to get very angry. Um, and the man, the graduate of Princeton, the white graduate says, what's the matter with you? Aren't you happy? You should be grateful that these Union soldiers went out um, and got your freedom for you. And it's at that point that Johnson says, I, I never quite had my freedom. And this is the statement that he made. Now, did Princeton College really own Johnson? That, of course, is the looming question through all my work. I mean, I can't say that there's a smoking gun that suggests that Princeton actually owned James Collins Johnson. And indeed, the Princeton uh, University position on the enslavement of human beings is that the university never itself uh, owned enslaved people. Certainly, there is no clear indication that that ever happened. Um, but I think, as my work would suggest, Johnson's position in the world um, was, and his position on campus was ambivalent. Um, and I just wanna talk a little bit about some of the value and meaning of this book without going through lots of the stuff on this slide. Um, I'll just leave it up here for a second and pull out a few of the things, um, but maybe an important aspect of this work is recovering and revising a slave narrative. Johnson's story certainly can be seen as a slave narrative. That is to say a story whether it's biographical or autobiographical that tells the story either of someone who was formerly a slave about the period after they escaped or even about their actual escape. So there are fugitive slave narratives within the broader character, uh, characteristic uh, sort of genre of slave narratives. And this one, not unlike a lot of others, tends to, when, when you look at the sort of classic Johnson story, what you find um, is that 
it's a very happy-go-lucky story. It's a story with a happy ending. Um, and, and it's also a story that until relatively recently, it was very well known by Princeton graduates. And so when I started this work, I was actually recovering something that had been common knowledge, at least on the campus, um, and something that had been nationally noted in its time. And I'm also revising it because I do work very hard to get past that happy-go-lucky story. Um, and then just pulling out uh, something else um, that's uh, of the material that's noted here. I, I would say another important aspect of my work is reading between the lines of the archives. Um, as I just said a moment ago, um, I spent lots and lots of time in the Princeton University archives, uh, in the New Jersey State archives, looking at historic newspapers. And there are lots of materials that reference Johnson either directly or indirectly, but there is nothing that's in his own voice. And so very often I do have to uh, read between the lines. And so just really briefly, and, and I will go through some of this again in my excerpts, but the common story is that Johnson is this enslaved man born in uh, Easton, Maryland in 1816. He was called James Collins then. He runs away in 1839, maybe via the Underground Railroad, it's not clear. He works as a janitor on the campus for four years. He claims that he knew Frederick Douglass when, he, when they were uh, children and young men, which may or may not be true, but that there's some possible evidence. Johnson is on campus. He's recognized by a student. He is recaptured, he's tried, he's convicted, but he gains his freedom when a wealthy white woman frees him. But as I show throughout my work, what is largely left out of that happy-go-lucky tale are the hardships. His liberty was not necessarily a sure thing, as I show. There's also significant physical abuse, as we'll talk about later. There are jokes. There's psychological abuse. In other words, Johnson's life was nothing like um, the happy-go-lucky story. And, and just really briefly to show you another image, this man here is Severin Tickle Wallace, Esquire, because he was a lawyer. This was Johnson's co-owner, and I designate him a co-owner because Severin Tico Wallace owned Johnson with his father, Philip Wallace. And it, Severin Tico Wallace came into his shared ownership when he was an infant, actually. It was apparently not uncommon uh, for enslavers to look out among their enslaved people and locate an infant born right near the time that the white child is born. An infant is selected and gifted to the child. When they're young, they are playmates and companions. As they get older, the black child, the enslaved child becomes servant, valet, man of all work. That's who James Collins Johnson was to Severin Tico Wallace. That's also why, as you'll see when you read the book, it's very likely why Johnson was recognized um, when he was at Princeton because these two were always together. Any young man who ever saw Severin Tico Wallace in his early youth would likely have seen Johnson close by his side. Um, and as I discuss in my book, there were a number of students from the Eastern Shore of Maryland, from that upper crust of society who would clearly have recognized Johnson. Severin Tico Wallace was a very important man, ambassador to Spain, provost of the University of Maryland. He helped to found the law school at Maryland. He was a prolific writer, published widely, but he never wrote a word about this case. And we can posit why that is. Um, another image I just wanna share briefly, the woman who helped to free Johnson, Theodosia Prevost, and those of you who are Hamilton fans may recognize uh, that name. Um, she, this woman, Theodosia, she's actually the granddaughter of uh, Alexander Hamilton's wife. So there's some really intriguing genealogical stories going on in my work too. But this house, uh, this is actually just down the street uh, from Princeton University in the Jugtown uh, section of town near out near Harrison Street for those of you who know town. Um, and Prevost was a quite wealthy woman. She was closely connected to many major figures of her time. She was, for example, uh, the step-granddaughter of Aaron Burr Jr., um, hence the Theodosia uh, Prevost connection. Um, she apparently pays the money, but as I discuss in my book, that's not as straightforward either, as it appears. Um, and then just looking at uh, this image here, Johnson's free life at Princeton was anything but free. 
What I have up here on the screen um, is actually a cartoon from a student humor magazine. And I don't think you can read the caption, so I'll read that. It says, returns from fishing and presents Gans with what he has caught. And this is supposed to portray James Collins Johnson doing one of the horrible things he was often ordered to do, dive into open latrines and retrieve gold pieces, watches, other sorts of things that students would intentionally throw in. And in fact, as a result of those sorts of activities, his nickname, the name by which he was known for decades, in fact, there were many archival uh, uh, materials at Princeton that called him this, he was called Jim Stink. And you can see the images of the white men in the cartoon, they're holding their noses. This is a picture of James Collins Johnson in his relative youth. You see at the bottom, a bottom there's some handwriting there. The original writing says, Jimmy Stink. There's handwriting that I think probably came from archivists later on that says James Johnson on top of that. And then later in Princeton, Johnson is shown here with a young man um, who is likely the nephew of one of his wives. He's a very elderly man. You can see he's still selling. And then finally, this is James Collins Johnson's tombstone um, taken uh, on a winter day when I was visiting uh, Princeton a couple of years ago for inclusion uh, in the book. And you see it says, James Johnson, the student's friend, died in 1902, erected by graduates of Princeton University. Uh, of course, there, there's a deep irony and sadness uh, to the fact that Johnson's memorialized as the student's friend, given the kind of life that he lived, given the ups and downs, given the great difficulties. One of the other interesting things about this tombstone that I learned uh, only uh, right on the eve of publication is that there are actually at least two other bodies in this grave. Um, so it's not just Johnson, it is Johnson's last wife and that last wife's sister. Um, and that goes to uh, what I briefly allude to in the book, the, the great invisibility of black women, both in, in Johnson's life in terms of how they are reflected in his story, um, and, and even in death. You know, you have two Black women who are lying in this spot um, who are not named. Um, and I'm going to end the show here. Um, and I want to talk uh, a little bit about some of the excerpts <clears throat> uh, that I have drawn from my book. So I I'm going to start with the very opening uh, of the book. And it captures uh, the sort of classic story. Um, and it begins, James Collins fled slavery in Maryland in August, 1839. He changed his name to James Collins Johnson along the way, apparently to obscure his identity. A few days after he fled, Johnson reached Princeton, New Jersey, where he obtained a job at the College of New Jersey, now Princeton University. Johnson worked on the college campus without incident until 1843 when disaster struck. He was arrested on suspicion of being a fugitive slave after a student recognized him and alerted Johnson's owner. Johnson's owner came to Princeton, had Johnson seized and detained for a trial as a runaway slave. Johnson was a judge to slave and slated for return to slavery. However, he was redeemed by a local white woman who had significant ties to Princeton. Johnson spent the next several years repaying the funds advanced for his purchase. He went on to become one of the best known vendors over his six decade career on campus. At his death, Johnson was described as, quote, the oldest Negro in Princeton. He was buried near what was then the whites only section of the local cemetery, lying only a few feet away from some of the regions and the country's most prominent citizens. This is the story that I heard from a Princeton graduate as I sat sunning myself in Firestone Library Plaza as a freshman. As a stereotypical Los Angeles native, I was friendly, relaxed, eager to talk to anyone who approached me. I was also a black woman who was the first in her family to attend college and I had come to Princeton sight unseen. I wanted to learn all that I could about the university and about the town surrounding it. So when the elderly white man in a vivid orange and black striped reunion jacket asked if I wanted to hear the story of, quote, an old time colored man, I smiled and I said, yes, yes, I would. 
The story that I heard that day stayed with me for decades. A lover of fairy tales, I enjoyed the story's happy ending. Then, as now, I relished the generative force of the tale to convey a particular sense of Princeton history and belonging, and I turned it over and over in my head. But understanding that few people's lives can be so neatly summed up, I vowed someday to learn more about James Collins Johnson. My research has shown that the truth of Johnson's life both before and after his arrival in Princeton was likely far less sanguine than most stories suggest. While his life as an ostensibly free man was clearly an improvement over slave, slavery in Maryland, neither the association of his mid-Atlantic enslavement with oppression nor the association of his escape north to Princeton with freedom is likely accurate. Johnson's life in Princeton was one of tremendous, tremendous, I want to read an excerpt now about Johnson's trial after he's arrested. The atmosphere at Johnson's trial was made contentious by the presence of persons outside the court proceeding. Local Blacks apparently came to support Johnson, and Southern students supported Wallace's claim. Before during and after Johnson's trial, local Blacks and pro-slavery students of the college were in conflict, so much so that Wallace and his lawyer feared that Johnson would be released by an assault on the place where he was jailed. While Southern students may have been chivalrous about addressing Johnson's plight after his conviction by supporting his purchase from slavery, some of them had also shown opposition to freeing Johnson and had helped Johnson's enslavers at the time of his arrest. According to a letter that Philip Wallace wrote after Johnson was arrested as a fugitive in 1843, quote, strange Negroes, close quote, appeared in Princeton to prevent Johnson's removal to Maryland. The Wallaces may have accepted payment to redeem Johnson largely to pacify this, quote, gang of blacks, close quote, who made, quote, every demonstration toward an immediate rescue, close quote. When the mayor of Princeton was unable to control the rioters, Wallace wrote, quote, Southern students of Princeton bearing arms helped hold off the black would-be rescuers, close quote. And some reports noted that there was some attempt to rescue Johnson and that, quote, Princeton College students from the South took part and dirks and knives were drawn. I want to read a little bit now about Johnson's life after the trial. Once James Collins Johnson was released, his life resumed a more steady pace. He continued his work as a college servant. At least one source shows him as among the people being paid for student laundry service. The next decades of his life, however, were not without challenges. These difficulties were due in part to a persistent racial gulf between blacks and whites on the Princeton campus. It is not surprising that there were strained racial relations between town and gown in the years after Johnson's trial. Life in the antebellum North was often markedly better for blacks in the South, but that did not mean that there was complete freedom. Given his narrow escape from slavery, Johnson was likely grateful for his job as a campus servant. It was not an easy job, however. During most of the years of Johnson's employment at Princeton, students were not allowed to keep personal servants the word slave was never employed in campus rule compilations. Many students therefore relied on Johnson and the other servants of the college for their personal needs. Each college building had one servant and Johnson and the other servants cleaned rooms and outer hallways, helped to maintain and organize the students' belongings, delivered and retrieved clothing from the town laundry, obtained fuel for lamps, fetched wood for fireplaces and stoves, Servicing wood stoves was especially onerous as the stovepipe often came loose and everything was covered with soot. Students sometimes complained that servants did shoddy or abbreviated work and some students even claimed that in order to ensure that work would be done, um, they needed to must their covers or dirty their floors. However, if servants were inattentive to some of their assigned tasks, it may have been due to the sheer volume of the work. Blacks on the Princeton campus were often not treated well. This was also true for Blacks in town. 
I go now to a passage that refers to Black women. Black women were sometimes the butt of Princeton students' salacious jokes and comments. Some sources suggest that Princeton students sometimes even went further and engaged in sexual relationships with Black women. A cartoon published in an 1853 issue of the Nassau Rake, a student humor magazine, alludes to such interest among the students. In the cartoon, two white male figures compare the looks of white women in Alabama with those in New Jersey and find New Jersey women lacking. One figure comments as they look at a dark skinned woman passing, quote, but I'll be darned if there ain't some right good looking nigger gals here, ain't there? Close quote. Members of Johnson's family were not exempt from such ribaldry. And in 1858 issue of the Nassau Rake, a joke is made about female members of Johnson's family and the suggestion that a white student has married um, one of those members of Johnson's family. The article goes on to end, quote, give my love to my wife and also to that dear child who was a father's pet and a mother's joy, a darling little nigger boy. This was common and student humor. Life for Princeton Blacks near the end of the 19th and the beginning of the 20th century differed little from some of the antebellum con conditions that Johnson met there. As Paul Robeson, and by the way, Paul Robeson, a Princeton native, lived right across the street from, from Johnson. It was a very tight-knit community. As Paul Robeson noted in a speech he made in the 1940s that recalled his early life in Princeton, quote, <clears throat> Almost every Negro in Princeton lived off the college and accepted the social status that went with it. We lived for all intents and purposes on a Southern plantation and with no more dignity than that suggests. All the bowing, scraping to the drunken rich, all the vile names, all the uncle tomming to earn enough to lead miserable lives, close quote. Although public officials boasted that at the beginning of the 20th century, there were no publicly supported paupers in Princeton, the black community often suffered particular economic and social ills. And now I, I turn to the very last uh, paragraph in, in my book, the conclusion. Princeton, like many other colleges and universities has started a conversation on slavery that in many cases serves as an acknowledgement of culpability for harms to people like James Collins Johnson and others who labored on campuses in slavery and slavery-like conditions. But as one scholar notes, there has been almost a fashion in, admitted, in admitting involvement with slavery, since many schools examining their own engagements with slavery are often only those venerable enough to have existed during the period of antebellum enslavement in the United States. It is one thing to say, mea culpa, I am guilty to the classes of individuals harmed by Princeton's and other universities involvement with slavery and its aftermath. It is quite another to say, debitor sum, I am indebted. For this, we must wait. And I'll stop there. You're muted. You know what, after six or eight months of doing this, I still forget to unmute myself. That was, that was fantastic, Lolita. Uh, uh, let, me, let me just ask you a few questions and then we'll open it up for, for questions from the audience. Can you talk a little, one of the most impressive things about the book is just the, the, the granular, granular level of detail of your research. Um, can you tell us a little bit about that process of research in case other folks are inspired to, to find uh, uh, similar things? Wow. Um, fortunately, I am the sort of person who loves granular research. And so um, one of the things that I did um, was to start my work um, at the Mud Library, which, as I alluded to earlier, has just a tremendous collection of student materials, uh, alumna, uh, alumnus material. And so in order to try to understand who James Collins Johnson was, or at least who he appeared to be um, from the student perspective, I looked at every single file of every person graduating from Princeton from about 1836 up until about 1845, meaning I wanted to cover 
all of the years during which uh, around when Johnson first arrived and arrived after his trial. And so I read all of those files. And of course, not every single one was very lengthy or full. So that's not quite as laborious as it might seem at first. Um, but one of the things that I also did was when I did find a student who alluded to Johnson um, in his materials, and, and this is just uh, another observation on the wonderful work um, of the Mud Library, uh, very often families over the decades uh, when their loved ones, their Princeton graduate loved ones would die, they would often donate back letters that they had received. And as I mentioned earlier, because Princeton students, early students were compelled frankly, uh, to write home, I would find letters to fathers and mothers, letters to brothers. And so, for example, where I did find that, I noted those families, I mapped them, I actually built family trees for several of them, because what I found is that a student who in, pick a year, a student who in 1850 talks about Johnson when writing back home, very often that student has a son and a grandson um, who turned up there and they are looking for Johnson. In fact, uh, one of, it's a small source, but it's perhaps one of my best sources. Um, Andrew um, Embry, who wrote a, like a very short little story about Johnson. He interviewed him when he was an undergraduate. Well, the Embry account, that happens because Embry's father and grandfather went to Princeton. And so Embry grew up hearing these tales. And so he says to his family, when I get to Princeton, I'm gonna meet that Jim Stink, and I'm going to interview him because Embry was, among other things, a tremendous journalist. And thank goodness for us and for my work. And so, those sorts of connections, uh, both reading the student materials and, and what I call in my book, uh, in the discussion of sources, I call it the genealogical approach. And and I, I don't mean something uh, that's more philosophical like Foucault or anything. I mean literally looking into people's family histories. So for example, uh, there's a chapter where I explore just who it was that betrayed James Collins Johnson. Um, history, or at least the common myth, suggests that it's maybe one student or another. But, but what I conclude from my research in doing family histories is that it's probably the first cousin of a student who doesn't even go to Princeton. Um, but he was a very close first cousin. He, in fact, marries, uh, his sister marries um, one of the students who was there. So this is a very close-knit family. They're all from the Eastern shore of Maryland. And I suspect that's who betrayed Johnson. So um, I, I would say a, a lot of this kind of work does require not just our access to archival material, but it requires reading between the lines. So when someone talks about Johnson in a particular way, um, that may suggest um, the relationship that they had with him. Even with the people suspected of betraying Johnson, I even went to some length to explore what's the likelihood that that happened. So there's this one man, I call him the Red Herring, because he had a name that was similar to the claimed betrayer. That turned out to be a northerner who's 10 years older than his classmates. That's probably not the betrayer. But in order to exclude him, I had to read student accounts of that student to realize this guy has no friends. <laughs> he probably would not have been close enough uh, to make the discovery about Johnson and then sort of be in on the secret and betray him. He just wasn't that person. And so um, part of my work, I, I would say it, it's sort of a deep dive in terms of archives and scholarly materials, but, but it's also a lot of detective work. I, I would say uh, maybe one of the things that helped me I'm a real Columbo fan. I mean, I really did feel like a detective um, sort of putting this together. Well, it, it, I, again, one of the pleasures of reading the book, and it's, it, it's not an easy book to read sometimes, and not because of your writing, which is wonderful, but because of the accounts. Uh, well, one of the joys of it is just watching you as detective. And, and I can see you going from one hallway in Mud Library to, to another. I, I wanted to ask you, do we have any accounts of, of, from Johnson or from other folks who were in similar positions contrasting what life in Princeton was like, certainly before the Civil War and maybe even after, with their life in Maryland? Yeah. What, <laughs> in some ways, only someone who has been enslaved can really tell what it's like to be free. Did he feel free or did he always felt that his identity, his ethnicity, his skin color uh, 
was like a permanent chain, even in, in a place like Princeton. Would you get anything like that? Unfortunately, there are no direct accounts from Johnson himself. Um, there are uh, a few fugitive slaves who came from roughly the same region uh, as Johnson, and we do have some of their accounts, and those are actually tremendously helpful. So, for example, uh, the Wallace family uh, that enslaved Johnson, they were a fairly large and quite wealthy and well-connected family, and there were a few of other Wallace kin uh, folks who had enslaved people run away and write accounts. And so I actually used those to try to extrapolate, to get a sense of just what was life like in Maryland. So for example, one of the things that I, I learned from reading those materials is that although the general assertion, at least by historians, mostly humanistic historians, is that if you were enslaved in the city, um, as was Johnson at parts of his life, then you were better off than if you were enslaved in the country. And what you find is that that's not necessarily true because, I mean, think about it. I mean, if you are enslaved in a townhouse as opposed to being out in a, a vast plantation where you can get lost sometimes, um, it, it's, uh, it's very intense. It's a very intense relationship. Um, you can actually also uh, think about narratives, slave narratives of people that are better known. I mean, look at work um, of uh, people like Sojourner Truth, who talks about being enslaved in New York State, a, a very northern enslavement. Um, and one of the things she says is that I, there's this real sort of ambivalence, this horrible ambivalence where your enslavers are parents and friends, and they feel like kinfolk but at the same time, they are keeping you in bondage. You can't leave and you're compelled to do what they say. Um, and so using those sorts of accounts, accounts of Northern uh, servitude or even mid-Atlantic servitude. And, and, and again, when people think of terrible conditions and enslavement, they often think of the deep South, Mississippi, et cetera. Mid-Atlantic and Northern slavery could be just as bad and often worse, often because um, it was, you were very close, in very close contact with your enslavers. It, but I'm wondering if, did Johnson in his, I, I, when I was reading the book, one of the things that drew me, that, that, that it, it most made me emotional was the idea of this 50, 60 year old father, probably grandfather, a man of great dignity. And he was treated by the students, even when they wanted to be friendly, in a really condescending manner, do, do we have any accounts of Johnson coming home and, and saying, I don't know how long I can take this, or, or did he just have to internalize all this? I, I think he mostly internalized it. I mean, and, and that actually, when you think about what some of my goals were at the start was, I desperately wanted Johnson to speak, meaning I wanted to find something in his own voice. The closest I come to was the, the quote that's on the cover of my book where he says, Princeton College bought me, I never got no free papers. Johnson was apparently a master of wearing a mask almost his entire time in Princeton. So everybody says, he's a happy, happy fellow. Now, one of the intriguing things that I, that I do at the very beginning of, of this book is, I spend a couple of pages doing what I call disaggregation um, or disambiguation. Johnson was followed by a couple of other famous black vendors and they too were seen as happy peppy guys. And, and very often there was a little bit of overlap between a couple of them and students not surprisingly would get them up get them mixed up. And in fact, it's almost shocking. Shortly after the death of Johnson, there is a passage in one of the Princeton publications saying, hey, guess what guys? Um, we got our new Jimmy, you know, there's a new black guy who's going to be fun and, and sell us things. There's this tremendous uh, condescension that Johnson mostly was oblivious to, but his successors, those guys, uh, they were a lot more, uh, they, they just had sort of a, a darker approach to living. So a couple of them were arrested, they pushed back against the police, they said not funny, but rather instead rude things to students. And so I'm intrigued, even as I write about those uh, successor vendors, I'm intrigued by how I imagine, how looking at Johnson, they decided 
I need to do this work. I want to do this work, but I'm not, I'm not going to be where this happy public image. And so I, I think Johnson mostly did, or at least that's much of what's recorded of him. What'd be fascinating is to get this book read by uh, African-American students and, and, and staff here at Princeton now. Mm -hmm. uh, and does this speak to you at all? Uh, let's hope not, but uh, one last thing. I know you published a, an editorial right after the school that I work in changed his name yes. uh, to the Princeton School for International and Public Affairs. Uh, and you, what would you want to talk a little bit about that editorial and what you meant by it and what it meant to you? Yes, I mean, and, and this is that editorial was much in the spirit of the last paragraph of my book. And then it basically says, look, I understand and I deeply appreciate the fact that institutions like Princeton um, and other colleges and universities are exploring and understanding what were some quite racist practices in their past, but we have to go farther. And so one of the things I talk about in the editorial um, is a figure who is very little known, um, a man named Carl Campbell Brigham, who was the father of the modern SAT examination. And Brigham was a student at Princeton and later on um, a professor in the fledgling psychology department. And he was, at least in his early youth, a rabid racist. In fact, uh, he was very clear in his beliefs that Black people, Asians, basically anyone who was not white, he was very clear in his belief that everyone besides white people was intellectually inferior. And in fact, one of the uh, early uh, actions of Brigham was to create the Army Alpha Test, which was a test that was supposed to sort out recruits by intelligence so you could put them in the right um, jobs in the service. Now, it is true uh, that uh, Carl Campbell Brigham did to some extent pull back from very uh, explicit racist beliefs, or at least he stopped writing those sorts of things, but he never clearly said he didn't believe that. He just, I think, stopped writing about it. And so what I say, I, I use that as an example that nobody's ever heard of this guy. And yet we're still using, in a lot of schools, including Princeton, we're still using the SAT, notwithstanding the fact that it was literally born. I mean, out of a, uh, an atmosphere that was explicitly, virulently racist. Um, that's just an example of something where I think schools like Princeton need to explore that. I, I, I don't necessarily say, oh, that means stop using the SAT. That's not what my op-ed was meant to say. I think what it was meant to say is that Prince, schools like Princeton need to explore a lot of these lesser known figures um, in its past. I mean, it's perhaps not surprising uh, that a, a number of major uh, sort of cultural touchstones in this country, a, a, lot, a number of what sort of both economic uh, institutions, a lot of those things have Princetonians or Princeton related people um, at their foundations. I mean, it takes someone like uh, Harvey Samuel Firestone, who's the namesake of our of our quite famous uh, library. And in fact, that was the place I first heard this story. I mean, Firestone uh, was a tremendous philanthropist, um, but he was also someone responsible for tremendous horrors um, in the country of Liberia. And let's just talk about Liberia. Liber Liberia was founded uh, by Princetonians. I think I can say that in summary. And, and that has a long and tortured history in and of itself as a place to send uh, freed slaves, that kind of thing. Meaning there are many, many people and many instances in history that are Princeton related that I think invite inquiry, let's just put it that way. Um, meaning removing Wilson's name from the School of Public and International Affairs is, uh, I think it was the appropriate thing to do after what I know to be a, a long and deliberative process. But I, I also believe that it is merely a first step uh, in terms of the sorts of investigations that, that need to go on. And again, I, I don't suggest what the outcome ought to be of those investigations. I, I think the investigations themselves uh, speak well uh, of the uh, good faith of an institution like Princeton. Mm -hmm. 
Thank you, thank you. Uh, I'm gonna take some of the questions that I've been getting and let me, I'm gonna combine a couple of them because you've gotten a huge number of questions and a huge number of compliments, uh, by the way. Uh, so one, one that I have heard, uh, that I've read in the, in the question and answer is, did you find any uh, family from Johnson? Was, uh, how long did the family stay uh, in what is now referred to as the Witherspoon Street neighborhood, et cetera? Uh, you also had some, some stories about he lived what then became Palmer Square, and you had some story about how Palmer Square was created, et cetera. Do you want to talk about that, about his family, et cetera? Yes, Liz, uh, let's start with that. Um, I was very much hoping um, that I would find a modern day descendant of James Collins Johnson. Um, I I'll just cut to the chase. I didn't find any direct descendants. The closest I found were descendants of Johnson's uh, last wife and and that gentleman and i thank him in the acknowledgements was tremendously helpful because for example he could do a little bit of photo id for me he could tell me about how the family actually eventually left princeton but but that was through a last wife johnson apparently had a, a son uh thomas collins um who uh was born in 1843 and, and that's of course interesting and tricky because uh, the census says he's born in Maryland. Johnson was apparently not in Maryland. Is it his biological son? I don't know. But he apparently has a son named Thomas who disappears, unfortunately, uh, from the record. So I don't know if Thomas died. And, and I, uh, in fact, I continue to look for that. Uh, Johnson also um, had a daughter who married and had two children of her own, but that daughter died young as did the two children. And so uh, those are the only children that I have found and it looks like Johnson's direct line, therefore, um, did not uh, persist. And, and, and it's sad, but it's actually also uh, fairly common for Black people in that era to be more likely to succumb to illness. I mean, there are a couple of instances, for example, of plagues and illness running rampant through um, the Black neighborhoods in Princeton, and I suspect that's what happened. Well, I'm, I'm afraid to say that's not just in the 19th and early 20th century as we're seeing with COVID. Uh, I had one question from someone who said, if he was such a popular person among the students and such an institutionalized presence on Princeton, why haven't we heard about this? Uh, are, there, are there many other Charles Johnsons uh, that we don't know about that just get lost, as you, as you said, because they don't get to speak their own voices? Absolutely. I, I wouldn't say that there are, well, first of all, why haven't we heard of him? One thing is interesting. I, I think if you had attended Princeton many time up to say, mm, and, and keep in mind, Johnson got to Princeton in 1839. For the next 100 years or so, people would have known who he was. Why? because of things like uh, legacy admissions, people's children and grandchildren knew about him. It was a story that was repeated, but you see, Johnson didn't speak in his own voice. And, and what ended up happening is that once the, the people who were giving these accounts, once they were dead, that was the end of it, right? That, that's why we hadn't heard of him. Now there, uh, uh, the, the question, this is a wonderful question. There are a number of black vendors who are probably themselves uh, worthy of a book like this. Like there is a man named Spader um, who came after Johnson. That was his nickname. He grew, uh, lived in and descended from a black family that lived in the Hopewell area. Um, he was a great entrepreneur. He behaved much like Johnson. He was called the peanut man, for example. He had jingles. He was a snazzy dresser. And in fact, he came right on the heels of Johnson um, shortly after Johnson died. Nobody's heard of him. Now, there are a, a few of that man's descendants still around who were thrilled to hear that I was starting to look into Spader. And in fact, I do have some early research on him. But, but I would say there are at least half a dozen other figures who are worthy of this sort of investigation. Uh, so for example, there is a man named Watkins who, believe it or not, was an instructor. He was a Black man who was a science instructor um, in the 19th century. And we're thinking, what? Yeah. I, mean, I mean, this man is pretty much invisible um, to contemporary history. And, and again, that's a, a Black figure who is clearly 
worth some sort of investigation, but we don't find, at least I haven't found any significant accounts about him. There are many students who in their student records write about him or some of them are begrudging. Like I was such a terrible student that I had to be tutored by Watkins because Watkins was often sort of sent to work on the so-called hard cases, uh, the, the students who just couldn't get it. Um, and so there were a tremendous number of people uh, who were like that. Many of the major scientists that we know about in the 19th century at Princeton, they often had black assistants who, when you examine closely, those black assistants were often the leading the experiments. Uh, there are a number um, of, of figures uh, like that who are, are worthy of research, but there's very little that's been said about them. I, one, uh, uh, one question that came through is, when does it, uh, this role that Johnson played, um, again, <laughs> a very Jim Crowish <laughs> role. When do you have any idea of when that that role disappeared? When was there no longer the expectation that they would be poor African American men selling you fruit or cleaning out your room? Um, do you know when this this role disappeared? My research suggests that after. After, during and after World War II, that's when you see these sorts of figures start to disappear. There are still maybe a few of them very aged around, maybe in the 50s, but, but after World War II, that's when a lot of this starts to disappear. And, and, and you can posit that, that lots of social roles change. Another interesting thing, of course, is that after World War II, that's when we start to see what I might call the democratization of the Princeton student body, meaning it wasn't just the sons of, of rich men who attended there. You, you had earnest, hardworking, smart boys. Uh, they were still all white, um, but some of them were from the working classes. And so there wasn't necessarily um, that, that same sort of very class bound expectation um, of there being this black happy minstrel there to serve. Um, there were boys from the heartland in Pennsylvania. There were earnest ministers' sons. Um, there were just more people who didn't necessarily thrive on the presence of, of, of those uh, sorts of figures. So, and again, I'm, 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 my apologies to the people who have written these wonderful questions uh, and points of clarification. I can't do justice to all of them. Uh, somebody's asked about, uh, uh, in a sense, about memory and, and, and truth and forgiveness. Um, mm -hmm. Let me take that to perhaps, I'm not sure he or she, I think it's a he, uh, push this. What, what should Princeton do about this legacy? What, we can read your wonderful book. We, uh, as you probably know, I don't know the last time you visited, we now have uh, plaques throughout campus that recall the presence and the lives of some African-American, again, mostly servants. Um, what would you suggest is, how do we deal, what's a step in reconciliation? <laughs> wow, that, that, that's a difficult question. I... Hmm. Uh, well, you know, let's talk about institutions that have a more direct engagement with slavery. And I'm thinking of institutions like Georgetown. And, and as you may know, uh, over in the last few years, it's come to light that Georgetown University once sold 272 enslaved people in order to keep the school going. What they did was they went out, they found the descendants of those people, I think that there are at least at this point a sort of a legacy style admissions program for those descendants. I don't think there's anything around tuition. There probably ought to be. Um, but uh, what would I expect to see in terms of reconciliation? I, I, I suppose that I would like to see, let's just start with more discussion and recognition. And, and, and I understand, for example, that there is this wonderful Princeton and Slavery Project that's been going on yep. for at least this the last seven or eight years. And as far as I know, that, that project is still growing. Every time I look at it, there are new materials. And, and I think that's a, a great source. Um, but but that I, I would like to see something that's more um, at the center of the institution. Not that that's marginal in any way, but unless you're someone who happens to be interested in history or Princeton and slavery, 
I suspect that you can go through Princeton from freshman year to, to the time you graduate and not even understand um, about these sorts of initiatives. And so, for example, I, I'd love to see a required freshman course or seminar that talks about some of these material or even some of these figures or that sends students out to do research that looks at things like, let's take the uh, Prospect House on campus, which I, I used to be, and I think probably still is faculty dining. I'm, yes. uh, I'm not sure. Um, but uh, recognize that Prospect House used to be like a little mini plantation with enslaved people. In fact, um, when it came into the ownership of what was then the College of New Jersey, I think it came with a couple of enslaved people. Um, and, and as far as my research suggests, some of those people are probably buried somewhere between that beautiful, wooded area and Washington Road. In fact, I strongly suspect their bodies under Washington Road, but that's another interesting project of mine. Um, we need to think about and talk about the, those things because that has been largely, I won't say erased because that suggests a, a, an amount of intentionality that I just don't think was, was there. Um, if there's been erasure, it, it's more been through neglect or disinterest. And so uh, I think that any efforts at reconciliation would have to start with, with significant ongoing centralized investigations into the roles that enslaved people played at the institution, or indeed, not just enslaved people, but, but other people of color. I mean, so for example, this really interesting strand of my work um, shows that in the mid 19th century, a number of students from the Cherokee tribe went to Princeton. In fact, many of the early principal chiefs were Princeton students and they got there after first attending Lawrenceville down the street. Who knew that? Um, I mean, th these sorts of things uh, that help Princeton students and I think anybody who is interested in or looks at Princeton, it, it helps with the recognition that these institutions, they don't come up out of nowhere. It's not just luck and pluck and hard work. Um, it often is often as the result of a lot of oppression and suffering. And yes, as you say, some of these stories in my book, they're hard stories, but they're necessary stories. And, and a lot of those necessary stories, both the ones I write about and the ones I don't, we have to centralize them. I I think you're going to have a lot of fans after after this talk. Now, I know your scholarship is on legal. I don't think lots of people are going to buy your legal work. Probably as, not. Uh, as fascinating as it might be. But are you thinking of continuing? What's your what's your next project? Because absolutely. I think there's a lot of people who will buy your book in advance. Um, absolutely. Um, I've got a couple of things. Uh, one book is on the intersection of Black Lives Matter and Me Too, which is unlike this project, but sort of like it when you talk about the role of race and, and gender uh, and blackness. But, but, but a, a newer project, which is more related to this one, um, is I am researching the role of slavery at the postbellum university. Um, at, one of the things I talk about uh, in my book is that my work comes out of a broader genre called slavery in the university. So for example, uh, Brown University, Harvard, William and Mary, there are a number of schools um, that, uh, Georgetown, there are a number of schools that are interrogating the role that slavery played on their campuses. Um, and as I mentioned, most of those schools are really old schools. They're some of our earliest institutions. But one of the things that we have to recognize is that I, I think it's fair to say, and I haven't done all the research, that a huge number um, of our prominent post-Civil War universities are also tied to slavery in some way. So for example, when you look at an institution uh, like Clemson uh, that's founded in the late 1800s, it's founded on a former plantation that belonged to John C. Calhoun. I mean, those sorts of things are more obscured. I mean, look at an institution like the one where I even work, SMU, Southern Methodist University. That's not founded until 1912 or so, but it's founded based on land gifted from a former plantation owner who came to Texas with $100, a dream, and several enslaved people. Um, and, and so uh, that's, uh, so I'd say my next project is to talk about the post-Civil War University and the, and the very close ties that higher education had to enslavement. Because if, if you think about it, there were relatively few ways for someone to gain uh, 
the sort of wealth that it would take to start a great university. I mean, let's go all the way west to a place like Stanford University. Um, many people probably know that Stanford University was founded by someone who generously would have been called a robber baron, meaning people who come, or look at someone like Carnegie, look at someone like James Duke. People who founded great universities had the sort of great wealth that sometimes, and I would go as far as to say even often, uh, came from oppression of, of someone. And, and that's easily revealed um, when you look at the post-Civil War university. So that, that's probably uh, the next very much related project. And I anticipate that in that work, people will be just as surprised or more surprised because even some of our well-known land grant or public flagships have, uh, ties to slavery that are very little known or explored. Well, if nothing else, Lolita, not only have you told this story, but I think you've inspired folks to go out after more stories. Uh, there's so. a lot of history to be unearthed, as it were. Thank you so, so much. I'm hoping if there's a few students watching, um, maybe it'll inspire them for a senior thesis or two. Oh, that would be thrilling. And, and side note, uh, if you check my end notes, I read uh, there's maybe two or three really great senior theses over the years that have touched upon some of this uh, material. And as you said, there are volumes of it. So I really do hope to see uh, lots of projects coming out of this. That's great. And please remember, everybody, here's the book. You can get it at Labyrinth Books or your local bookstore. Uh, thank you again. And now uh, we're going to go off to a little space where uh, we reserve for some Princeton students to ask questions. Thank you so much for attending today. and. Uh, Bravo. Thank you. And can I just say before we end, uh, for those who want a signed copy, um, you can go to Buxton Books in Charleston, South Carolina. Um, that is the store owned by one of my classmates. Um, and he very generously has helped me uh, to coordinate uh, some signed copies for those who want to do that. That's great. Thank you so much, Lita. I'll see you in a little bit. Bye. See you soon. Bye-bye, everybody. Thanks you again.